And joining me right now uh, is U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer, an ambassador. It's wonderful to see you this morning. Thanks so much for being here. Maria, it's a pleasure to be here. First, a big congratulations to you and your team. You've been working on this for uh, a long time. You finally got it across the uh, finish line in terms of getting the agreements that you needed. How tough was it in the last couple of weeks? And what about this most recent snag with Mexico? Can you tell us what happened and how you ironed it out? Well, so first of all, it's been a you know a, a real slog for for more than two years. The the president ran on in part NAFTA being a really unbalanced agreement for the United States, and it, it had turned out to be one. Plus, it was in desperate need of being upgraded, and so we had us focus on that. We focused on it uh, over the course of two years. We finally got the negotiation done in about a year, and then the last year we spent uh, uh, trying to find a way to get through Congress. I think we have we have the. The, the first trade agreement in a long, long time that has support of almost every business group, almost every agriculture group, labor groups, uh, Democrats and Republicans. So the, we're really excited about where we are. This last minute slag, I think, uh, uh, snag, I think was more of a misunderstanding. We're putting uh, uh, some, some labor attaches in the embassy down there. We have attaches all over the world and not just labor, but as, as you know, uh, a defense and a whole variety of agencies have them, some dozen agencies. And so I think there was a misunderstanding down there about what their function was. So, but that was easily taken care of. This is a really, really, really good agreement for the United States for manufacturers and uh, workers and, and farmers and the like. So. Uh -huh. It should pass with a big number. Yeah, tell me about that, because farmers get to see uh, more of a market in terms of their dairy. Uh, you've got manufacturers also uh, seeing more work. And, of course, the auto workers, uh, part of the deal, it, it was key in terms of having much of the production of a vehicle in North America. Tell us the most important points of USMCA. Well, I mean, for me, the first thing is it's going to bring back manufacturing jobs to the United States. Look at... Uh, before the president directed me to start this process, eight of the previous 11 auto uh, 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 manufacturing facilities manufacture, uh, are, are created, built in, in North America, were built in Mexico. There was a huge flow down towards there of our, of our uh, automobile industry. We've now turned that around. At the same time, it's good for Canada and Mexico also. It's not just good for the United States. So I think we're going to bring back, we think, somewhere around 80 or bring back or create around 80,000 jobs directly and indirectly in the auto industry, create some 25 or $30 billion of new investment. Uh, in, the, in the agriculture area, uh, there is, there's new market opportunity. As you say, the dairy problem, particularly in Canada, was a huge problem. Remember those stories about those dairy farmers going out of business? We've turned that around. Uh, we have new access in, uh, in wheat, in poultry, in eggs. So, uh, you know, there's just an awful lot in there for a lot of people. And then we have the whole new economy. We have what is really the, the absolute gold standard on digital trade and financial services, stuff that's never been done before. So, so this will be the template, I think. For, for new trade agreements going forward, and hopefully they'll be more balanced. We have a we have a big trade deficit problem. We were losing our jobs for years to 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 a variety of places, including China. And and the president the president ran on that. Yeah. He ran on trying to bring these jobs back. Uh, Ambassador, I'm sure you saw the Wall Street Journal op-ed yesterday titled "North American Damage Control," and in it they write, "The shame is that in many respects this new deal is worse than NAFTA, especially its bows to politically managed trade. It tries to steer auto investment with new rules of origin that 75 percent of a car's contents must be made in North America. This raises the cost of manufacturing, making North America products less competitive worldwide. They also had a problem." with the biologics, he says, Mr. Trump also bowed to the Pelosi Democrats' demand to remove the 10-year protection for data exclusive to biologics, a blow to one of America's growth industries. What do you say? Well, I would say, first of all, clearly getting rid of the biologic provision was a step backwards, and that's compromise. You know, there are consequences. The Democrats uh, control the House, and that was necessary, and I'm sorry about that. With respect to everything else in that negotiation, I think it made the bill better. In terms of the Wall Street Journal, look, there's two approaches to trade. One is that the objective of trade is purely market efficiency and protecting investors. And that's, that's one view, and that's the Wall Street Journal's view. 
The president's view is we have to, in addition to that, think about the effect on manufacturing workers and farmers and the people that are involved in this process, and that our real objective is, 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 is more wealth and, 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 and better lives for working class people and farmers. That's what the president's view is. He, he, he believes in market efficiency, but he also believes we have a broader responsibility. And I understand the people that believe in, in just protecting investors and, and, and uh, pure market efficiency. They're not going to be happy because we are making it more expensive to, to operate in some other areas and less expensive in the United States. The president's objective is to help manufacturing workers in this country. It's to help farmers in this country. Global efficiency is a nice objective, but he always says he got elected president of the United States, not president of the world. So he has a different, he has a different philosophy. And, and uh, you, hopefully the Wall Street Journal will understand that. They seem to acknowledge that a number of the things in this bill are even by their standards good. For example, the digital trade and these sorts of things. So, yeah. look, there's a little different philosophy. The president is taking care of American workers and farmers, and that's what his objective is, and that's what he told me to do. But, but it also doesn't change the U.S. law, right, which is 12 years of protection, uh, but Mexico allows only five and Canada eight. Does, they, they write this new deal sends a signal that the world can loot American property rights. So, so on this question of biologics, you're right, it does not change uh, uh, U.S. law at all. My objective was to have Mexico and Canada have a higher standard than they have right now. Uh, I think there's some general trend towards higher standards in this protection anyway, and hopefully we'll see that. Uh, it's important that we protect intellectual property rights in the United States. One of our great, great competitive advantages is innovation. We're a, we're a country of innovators, and, and the, the biologics area and the pharma area are a great example of that. I always tell these people that criticize these, these companies, what happens when your child gets sick? You're going to want to have this medicine available. Yeah. So, so there's a balance there. But look, this is a spectacular deal for the, yeah, for the American economy. Literally, it'll, it'll raise the GDP somewhere between a third and a full percent. It'll create somewhere between 175 or 80 and 500,000 new jobs, I think more towards the high end. And it's going to set the a template, a trajectory for how trade should be dealt with in the future. And it really, really, really is good for America. Well, that's a big boost to GDP. You think that's going to be, be seen within the next year or so? I mean, will we feel this strength in GDP? So I think you're going to see a real growth, and I'll let Larry Kudlow and Peter Navarro and other economists mm -hmm. talk about when. What the ITC said at the high end, when fully implemented, yeah. it'll create 1.2%. Uh, percent of GDP and about over 550,000 jobs. So that's when fully implemented. So it's, it's clearly going to have a big impact yeah. right away. And Besson, let me move on to China because this is your first cable news interview since the announcement of that phase one trade deal with China. White House economic advisor Larry Kudlow says that the U.S. exports to China will double under this agreement, which could be signed next month. What I'm, what I'm concerned about is the uh, intellectual property issues here as well. China, as you know, just came out with these new rules. I feel like they're coming at us at, at, all, at all ends with new rules to, to change uh, the dominance and continue dominance. I mean, uh, the, Gordon Chang writes, after all these cybersecurity rules are in place, no foreign company may encrypt data so that it cannot be read by the Chinese central government uh, and, the, and the Communist Party. Chinese officials will be permitted under Chinese law to share seized information with state enterprises. So what does this phase one deal really do to protect intellectual property in the U.S.? So let me take a step back again here, Maria. We have, we have two different systems. We have a free market system. They have a, a state-run uh, socialist uh, system. We have to find a way for these two systems to work together. And that's what we're starting to do. The, the relationship has been very unbalanced for a long period of time to the United States. We, we have huge trade deficits and we have other, other problems. The president, two and a half years ago, said we're going to take this on. We've had a plan that we followed consistently. We put out a report for eight months that, that took eight months to write. We put in place uh, a, a variety of tariffs over a period of time. We've tried to negotiate. There's been ups. There's been down, as you know, because you followed it very closely. This is a very, very important uh, um, uh, uh, issue for the United States 
not only now, but, but in the years and years ahead. We've now gotten to the point that where we have a very good phase one agreement. And we're going to find out whether or not it works. Is this agreement going to solve all the problems between the United States and, and China? No, for sure it will not. But it has real, real structural change. It's not just about purchases. And it's really important that people understand that. This has real protection on IP, real protection against tech transfer, financial services opening, currency provisions. Uh, there are agricultural barrier eliminations. And then there are these purchases. And, and yes, we expect this to, to just about double overall exports to China, which is really important. And, and, and particularly for some of our constituents that have had problems in the agriculture area, between 40 and 50, we think $50 billion worth of sales uh, in, uh, you know, you know, um, in China. So this is a really, really important bill. Is it going to solve all the problems? No. Will it work? It's totally enforceable. Uh, so we're, we're hoping that it works, but ultimately that's going to depend on what happens in China. Yeah. If the hardliners in China are in control and they don't make changes, that's one case. If you see the reformers who really want to see uh, China, China uh, adopt some of the normal principles uh, of, of trade, then I think you'll see a different outcome. But we're hopeful. We're hopeful. Yeah, I, I think what I like most about this phase one deal is the U.S. didn't give up too much. I mean, you didn't put those tariffs on on Sunday, which uh, w were expected the increase in tariffs, but you also just cut tariffs from 15 percent to 7.5 percent, so you didn't really give up too much. But in terms of these agricultural buys, walk us through this. Because for a long time we were expecting that the Chinese would agree that 50, up to 50 billion dollars in agricultural purchases was on the table, but they wouldn't admit it. So can you walk us through exactly how these details are emerging on how China will increase imports to the U.S. Uh, by as much as 200 billion dollars over the next two years? What are they going to be buying, and what is the commitment? So, all right, first of all, be, be, and I will be happy to do that. Let me say before, you're right, we still have tariffs on 380, approximately, billion dollars worth of Chinese goods. There's plenty of leverage on both sides to make sure that this agreement works. Uh, the president kept in place these tariffs, and so uh, the United States, uh, I think, made a really, really good deal. Now, on the purchases, there's an agreement over the next two years to purchase $200 billion worth of new products. They're in four categories. There's manufacturing, energy, agriculture, and then services. In the agriculture area, let me tell you how we get to $50 billion, all right? $24 billion is the base from 2017. That's what we had before all this, uh, at the high water mark, before all this uh, recent uh, change. In addition to that, China's agreed to buy $32 billion worth of products over the next two years. So that would be 60 and would get you to 40. They are, they are striving to take an additional $5 billion. And then there are other products, that, and this will all be written out, that get you to 50, that are in areas um, that, that, that are agriculture, but sometimes are classified as other manufacturing. Let me give you an example of that, forest products hardwood, lumber. So there are a variety of issues. It gets you up to $50 billion. Uh, we're very excited about it. That's, that's just about doubling our agricultural sales. And uh, it's, it's going to be good for farmers across the board. And by the way, it's going to be good for China. The United States has the best agricultural products. We have, we have the, the best prices. And so we're, we're really excited about that part of it. But I want to emphasize this is not just about purchasing. This is about structural change. This is about taking the first big step to determine whether or not two different systems can work together in the future to their mutual benefit. And that's what the president has asked us to do. And then we'll move forward. We'll see how this goes. We'll see how it's implemented, and we'll move forward. And, and, and hopefully, it is a we'll feat. find a way that we can both we can both get rich. You, Pardon me. You, you, it is a feat because you've got completely different approaches to governing the U.S. and China. So that whole conversation about the human rights abuses, the Uyghurs uh, in China in concentration camps—is this a side conversation? Is this not part of the current discussions in terms of trade and open access for financial services companies within China? 
I, look, for me, it is, Maria. I'm yeah. not trying to solve all the problems in the world. The yeah, president asked point. me to, to work on work on trade. Trade's really important to our workers, our farmers. It has a real effect on Americans. There are other people working right. on other things. And if you try to get it all balled up together, you literally will accomplish nothing. A Ambassador, this what? is an enormous... Yeah, one last thing I should say on this point. Let's remember, it took a long time to get to where we are. No other president did anything on this. They all talked about it. They all complained. No president did anything on You're this. Right. This president has taken on a very, very difficult task. He's done it with a plan. He's done it over two and a half years. Now he has a very, very significant step forward. We'll see how it works out. Well, what's next in terms of priorities? Uh, British trade negotiations obviously have been talked about. Prime Minister Johnson reportedly adding a revision to the Brexit bill that would rule out extending the transition period be beyond December 2020 raising the risk of a no-deal Brexit, sending the pound down, the British pound. Uh, is, is Great Britain expected to leave the European Union by January 31st of 2020. Is that the next priority, or is it the EU in terms of the next big trade deal? It's, it's funny. The president um, tells me what my priorities are. I don't tell him, and he has a lot of priorities. So for sure, the U.K. is a priority. As soon as they get their objectives agreed to, we'll start talking. It'll take a while before it all comes into effect because of their circumstance. It'll be a really big deal, and we're looking forward to that negotiation. We have issues with the WTO. We have issues with, with, uh, uh, with Europe, as you suggest. And then there are a lot of other countries with whom we're talking. So there's a lot on the, on the plate. As you know, this is something the president cares about. He thinks about it every day. He wants manufacturing jobs back here. He wants services workers to make more money. He wants farmers to reverse this trend in income. So there's a lot, a lot to do, and he's very focused on it. And, uh, and trust me, I don't go a day without him, uh, uh, you know, keeping the pressure on. <laughs> I'm sure. But there is a lot at stake, certainly with Europe, uh, in terms of tariffs potentially increasing on cars, vehicles coming out of Europe. Talk to us about the chicken tax. The president calls himself a tariff man, and yet a lot of worry around what he may do with regard to Europe. Where are the worries there? Well, I mean, let's... Now, look, at the WTO decided in, in favor of the United States after many years of, of, uh, of litigation on this Boeing Airbus case. And we put in place tariffs on $7.5 billion worth of products. We're looking at that. We may increase that. Our objective is to get a, some kind of a negotiated solution. But we have a very unbalanced relationship with Europe. It's about 150, maybe even this year, 180 billion dollars uh, uh, in the negative. That can't continue. There are a lot of barriers to trade there, uh, and there are a lot of uh, other problems that we have to address. So dealing with Europe is something that's, that's, that's very important. The president has focused on. We began to take steps. We've put tariffs in place on a variety of products, and we're going to continue to focus on that. It's something the president cares about. You can't get the global trade deficit down without getting the trade deficit down with Europe, so it, uh, it, at least significantly. So, so that's a really important focus for us. But On the other hand, we have a very good relationship with Europe. I don't want to, I don't want to make it look all, all negative. We have a, well, there's a lot of trade between the two bodies that, that's very positive. But, but, but would fixing the trade imbalance with Europe hurt the U.S. Uh, economy because of higher prices paid for vehicles here? Well, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not prejudging what, okay. what we're going to put tariffs on, and I'm not saying that, that, that cars will be more expensive. I, I don't want to get into that. We, we have a basic trade problem with Europe. We have to figure out a way to sell more in Europe, uh, and, and, I, and I think we're under, going to undertake that. But, but on the other hand, there, there are hundreds of billions of dollars worth of two-way trade between us and Europe, and I yeah. don't want to overstate the problem. A Ambassador, before we go, let me ask you about the changes at USMCA post all the pushback from Nancy Pelosi. And the Democrats, because according to Nancy Pelosi, the the bill she first got was a non-starter from President Trump. She's taking, she's at least trying to take a lot of the credit for this success. I know you've been working incredibly hard uh, in, in terms of getting this done and to where you wanted it. But is it much different? Well, I would say we improved it. But, but let me say this: from the very beginning. We worked with the Democrats. This is not like the Democrats came in at the end. We worked from right. the very beginning. Look at, look at, working men and women supported the president 
very, very strongly. Absolutely. These are these are his constituents too. So in terms of our negotiation, should the speaker get credit? Of course he should get credit. And so should should Chairman Neal, and, and so should Chairman Grassley, and so should uh, uh, Kevin Brady and the and the leadership on Republican and Democrat. The thing about this bill is. It, it, it has business, agriculture, Republicans, Democrats, and labor unions. Yep. It is the way forward. And in terms of this, 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 this business that yeah. that, that we increased labor uh, enforcement, of course we did. Yes. But 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 that's not against Republican principles. That's consistent with them. Bob Lighthouse, it's great to see you. You are a true diplomat. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am.